You're listening to the Hunt Suburbia podcast. I'm your host, Pat Guyette. Big bucks I've been dreaming often. Every night till I'm in a coffin. From Mount Woods to the burbs of Boston. I'm looking for a tree to get lost in. Chris Morning's little dust in the snow. Quality time, just me and my bow. Fall evenings, I know just where to go for some quality times for me and my bow. It's just me and my bow. All right, another episode of the Hunt Suburbia podcast. And um, we're just going to go through some updates on the season. Uh, It's a little bit tough to get uh, some guests during the hunting season and being very busy at home um, with my son. And my wife now is uh, seven months pregnant. It's hard to get guests uh, to come down. So during the hunting season, you know, a lot of this this is going to be updates. I do have uh, hopefully some guests coming next week. I'm going to try to get two, um, you know, two in a row so that we can get some hunting stories. Um, you know, a couple guys who have been really successful so far this year killed two really nice bucks. Um, and, you know, just l- listeners who, who've got some great stories to tell and uh, we'll dive into strategies and whatnot like we always do. But, um Whenever I can, I'm just going to give you guys updates on the season, um, you know, what's going on, and uh, you know, talk talk about the future a little bit and what's in store. But right now, I'm actually driving up to Vermont for the Vermont rifle season opener, going to my deer camp. Um, I've talked about it before on the podcast. I mean, going everything started at deer camp for me. I think I started going out there when I was nine. Uh, eight or nine just kind of going with my dad every once in a while maybe once a year and then when I turned 12 I was at I was at camp every weekend of the season with my dad with my brother we'd be there every single weekend and the three rifle weekends and then the two muzzleloader weekends um, and that's where I learned the majority of my hunting pretty much I guess all of my hunting until I started hunting in Massachusetts uh, four or five years ago now with a bow. Everything I'd, I'd, I'd done had been learned at deer camp. And it's a special place for me. Um, you know, it all started when I was a kid, you know, before I started going out there. Again, I think I've talked about it, but, you know, dad would go away for the weekends. And we're, you know, where's dad? Oh, he's out at deer camp. And you just have, it's kind of this mythical, like, I'd be, we go there in the summer and stuff, but it's in the summer you're doing other stuff. I wanted to know what was going on at deer camp. Why was dad so excited to go? Why was he so happy? Um, uh, you know, what was it about camp that was so magical, right? So as a kid, you, that kind of builds up in you over over the years until you're finally, you know, you go out for a couple of day trips, you go hunting day trips, but still too young to kind of stay, stay overnight. And as you get older, you realize that some of that was, um, you know, beds. There's, we have 10 total beds there. And they'd be filled up by adult hunters and guys who are actually going to go out and hunt and who had been going there for a long time. So, you know, you really want to, with your with your kids, um, wait until they're sufficient enough, I guess, to go out and, and really, really give give that bed's worth uh, of, of hunting, you know, um, before you kick somebody out who is going to give it their all out there. Um, so there's a little bit of that and a little bit of, you know, being a little being too young at camp it can be uh you know people have to watch what they say and it just kind of changes the whole the whole experience you know um for for everybody else so you know they like to party you you drink late at night you have conversations you don't want to have to curb that and you don't want you know your really young kids listening to some of that stuff so um i get it and as i got older you kind of realize that's that's what it is but again once i started going out 12 13 years old um you know at that point (laughs) uh old enough to be a part of those conversations and you really start cutting your teeth in the woods and um 
the thing with with this camp, it's you know I, I hunted there for years and years and years, and I still hunt every every year. I at least get back for the opener of rifle. Um, as I've started to become more interested in bow hunting uh, in Massachusetts, I've gone less and less weekends to camp. You know, I still went every all five of those weekends up until a couple of years ago. But needing to stay home, got the young family hunting closer to home and getting into bow hunting. Now I, I tend to um, stay close to home and, and hunt less up here, but always get up here uh, for opening weekend at least. That's, that's the tradition. So, and I have a lifetime license. I won, the, I won my lifetime license, uh, I think I was 15 or, six, I, 15 or 16, they had youth day, um, big youth day uh, celebrations at uh, the place we checked in all of our you know all the deer and we still check in our deer there um they used to have a big youth day celebration there during youth weekend actually it started out as a youth day there was only one day and then it expanded to youth weekend uh after i was out of that program um but yeah you you you'd go down and everybody got raffle tickets and they would pick door prizes and kind of kind of a lot of what i'm doing at huntstock maybe that's where that idea came from everybody's gathered around and they would uh they would pick winners and stuff and they would pick a couple of lifetime licenses every year and i won one of those so even though i'm out of state now i still got a lifetime license i hunt for free in vermont with a rifle uh uh, you know one buck tag one bear tag you get that for free every year the rest of my life so anyway i'm going back now um uh what was i gonna say about oh so yeah like i've majority of my experience and they're pretty big woods you know it's probably 3500 acres across the road 3500 acres behind camp um you know contiguous pieces of woods that we hunt uh but it's it's uh it's always been kind of hard to find a go-to spot you know this is at deer camp in vermont people have their go-to spots and they're there every opening day every opening weekend they'll go back to their go-to spot for 10 15 20 years um and then usually after 10 15 you know the wanderlust gets into gets into guys and they want to change it up you know so for instance when my uncle um stopped going to his go-to spot he wanted to find a new spot he did some more scouting that year he found a spot and he's been there now for 10 15 years and his son my cousin aaron um you know sits in in uh his dad's old go-to spot so some spots kind of get passed down and um it's cool because you build up and i sat in my dad's go-to spot which was um somewhat close to um my uncle's where my cousin now sits i you know i sat there for a few years too but i've always kind of had a wanderlust and i bounce around and try to find uh new places but it's really tough to find a spot a go-to spot that's not um, taken by somebody else and plus now that like I, I really like to learn learning from bow hunting I like to hunt the wind um, and you, you know you kind of need a bunch of go-to spots if you're going to hunt the right wind um, but now what I like to do because I sit so much when I'm when I'm bow hunting it's just sitting 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 in a tree you know for hours and these last couple weeks I've really been um, hunting out of my saddle and getting used to the saddle here and I like the saddle, but it's pretty uncomfortable for an all-day sit uh, and always changing positions and stuff. And um, I I have been exclusively hunting with the saddle for the last two weeks, though, and I like it. And I really like how it's, uh, you know, helps with mobility and it's less cumbersome than carrying around a climber. Um, it's still heavy. It's still a little bit cumbersome. You got sticks sticking out of your pack, but it's like way better. There's nothing dragging, getting caught in, you know, trees and, and bushes and prickers and stuff like the climber, uh, you know, the climber cables will get stuck and stuff. And no matter how hard I try, the climber is pretty loud. Things will clang, click and clang every once in a while. And, um, at least with the saddle and the sticks, I've so far got a system, and I know I'm going to hone in on it every year over and over, and that's what people do. They get they get their system down better. They make things quieter. They get quicker with everything. But for, for now, I'll, you know, only being a couple weeks of using it steadily, I've got a pretty good system down with the saddle where it's at least quiet, and I'm not banging it off of stuff. Um, the loudest 
the the loudest uh, it is is when you're coming down from the tree, and um, so far I've been kind of as I'm coming down taking sticks down and stuff. I've just been dropping them by the tree because to save time. I don't like being up up in the tree in the dark and you know attaching every stick back to my belt and climbing down with all that stuff that they clang off each other there too so i just been dropping them um around the tree so it's just a big thump and sometimes you hear a little clanging when, when it hits the ground but um that's what i've been doing and anyways that goes all the, <laughs> it's hard to do these podcasts by yourself because i go off on a little tangent but uh i'll circle back and what i'm trying to say is when i go to vermont now less and less do i like to sit all day um I want to still hunt. I want to move around. I want to cover tons of ground. And this weekend, uh, tomorrow, it's 100% rain. So it's it's going to be rainy and windy, which, you know, some guys at camp I, you, getting texts saying, hey, you might want to come up next weekend because the, week, the weather sucks this weekend for hunting. But I, you, you know me from the podcast, I love rainy and windy days, especially, and I love them with a bow, but with a rifle, you're extending your range. So... Um, this is kind of like perfect scenario for me. I wanted to still hunt all day tomorrow anyway, and with some rain and wind all day, it should be quiet walking. I should be able to cover a lot of ground and hopefully shoot a buck. I'm going to shoot anything that's legal. I'm not going to, you know, hold out for a racker. I'm going to shoot anything that's legal as kind of is the, uh, MO at deer camp. So, uh, that's what I'm going to do tomorrow is just walk walk around uh a lot so there's gonna be guys and guys like when i walk too because they go to their go-to spots they sit down and i'm creeping through the woods if uh if i don't get up on something bedded or jump something to get a shot off then i can jump something and push them towards uh towards guys who are sitting so um i'm looking forward to walking and not sitting in a tree all day and just walking so that's that's my game plan right now i still don't know where yet i'm gonna go across the road behind camp um but wherever i go i'm gonna try to do seven to ten miles um and i don't want to walk super fast i want to still hunt um so you know when i went tracking with neil pendleton last year i think we did 13 or 14 miles but we were walking at a real good steady clip looking for tracks um probably i want to do half of that you know because i'm gonna creep along on uh tops of ridges you know bounce around the edges of bedding areas what, what my strategy is going to be is to get to a top of a big ridge somewhere and i'll probably sit for the first 45 minutes of shooting light and if i don't see anything then i'm going to start creeping um because i do want to it's the rut right so deer bucks are going to be up you know a lot of the day but they're still going to bed down and um i i want to I don't want to sit too long in one spot because I, I, I do want to get up and start creeping um, while it's still early morning and those bucks are more likely to be on their feet moving. I want to be able to catch one moving. Because I think when you're still hunting, catching one moving ahead of you is your best bet at shooting a buck. It's kind of walking quiet enough to catch one moving. You know, it's much easier to see them, obviously, than if you're trying to sneak up on them when they're betting. But the plan is to get high, sit for 45 minutes, um, see if I can catch something going through a funnel on the 40, 45 minutes uh, after shooting light, and then get up and creep um, and try to stay high, stay three quarters of the way up a ridge or so, um, and creep along the edges so that that way you're looking down and you're kind of coming down anytime you can get high when you're still hunting so you can look down on beds and um you just have the advantage over a buck if they get up and they start running you you can see them for longer as opposed to if you're kind of down near the bottom of a ridge and, and creeping along they're likely to be bedded above you harder to see them that way and when they you know get up and if you jump them it's going to be harder to catch them running eat too they they can be gone in a bound but if you're looking down on them you can see them for a lot longer so that's that's kind of the strategy stay high walk walk along uh, try to keep the wind in my face uh if it's it does look like it's going to swirl a little bit the morning is going to be a southeast wind then it's going to change to northwest so but it does look pretty steady northwest uh after about 10 a.m but i'm sure there'll be some swirling and when you're still hunting you can't really you know control that um 
but yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to do that. Keep try to keep the scope dry and uh, using my seven uh, uh, thirty out six. 7600 series uh, pump action shooting 150 grains i got a scope on it um and uh dude i just can't I, i'm super excited to walk around and uh probably try to coordinate a little bit with my cousin with scotland who's going to be out at camp see where they're sitting and you know walk around without ruining their spots but you know close enough that if i bump something maybe they uh can bump it bump it right to them um what else? Uh, deer camp. Well, I might as well tell us some deer camp stories. I think uh, the first, my first buck I got, my first deer. It was a button buck, actually. Um, I got a deer camp when I was, I believe, eleven, eleven or twelve years old. Got it in nineteen ninety eight. Ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight. So I was eleven. Um, that was just not too far behind camp you know dad brought me up there we sat down i fell asleep <laughs> i was i believe i was nodding off my dad woke me up there's a deer there's a deer coming up the hill I'll wake up be quiet you see it yeah i see it all right well whenever you get them in your scope take a shot and um i shot it. i think i ended up shooting it three times i shot it. my dad said shoot again shot shoot again keep shooting until he goes down shot again i was using a 32 special that uh, was passed down from my grandfather. I think it was a 19, a gun from the 1910s, 30, uh, 32 special lever action, um, nice short barrel, lightweight gun, kind of equivalent to a, a 30 30. Um, I love that gun. Uh, and, uh, but it's, you know, it doesn't pack a huge punch. But anyway, you place it the right place the bullet the right spot, it'll do the trick. Um, I, I shot him three times, it went down. Super excited. Short drag back to camp. That's where kind of everything, everything started. Um, after that, when I when I turned, I think it was the next year when I turned twelve, I started hunting on my own. Um, you know, we it starts out you hunting on your own with your dad, uh, but you sit, you know, 150, 200 yards away. You walk in with him. He kind of drops you off in a spot, and you sit there. And uh, so he's close enough if anything happens. Um, shoot a deer he's right you know a couple ridges or a ridge over so that's kind of how age uh, 12 13 went I think 13 was my second deer up there and that was a spike horn I shot in the oak flat uh, up behind camp little spike had uh, three inch spikes Um, but I still remember that one to this day we were using radios back in the day walkie talkies and uh, I remember one of the guys at camp radioed Pat, are you in the oak flat? Yeah, I'm in the oak flat. Well, I bumped, I bumped a deer, um, and I think it's heading towards the oak flat. So then I get all excited. And uh, sure enough, that, that spike horn was walking through 7.30, 7.45 in the morning. Shot him. Uh, I think I shot him three times as well. My dad could hear. He was only next ridge over, so he... Uh, you know, got on the walkie-talkie. I got one. I got one. He's like, he's he's excited to come over and help. Um, so he came over and helped me gut it out, and uh, we dragged we dragged that one back. That was my second buck. Um, after that, it's kind of hard to remember the sequence of deer. I think the next deer I got was a doe during muzzleloader season, um, and that I think that might have been the doe that. I shot, we tracked for a long ways. There was snow on the ground. We tracked a long ways for blood. Uh, laid down in a bed and lost quite a bit of blood. Tracked it. What I think happened is we were pushing it. And, you know, becoming a bow hunter really, um, it makes you a better hunter in many ways. But one way, you know, I, I, it was a foreign concept to me that you shoot a deer and it doesn't die right away. Um, well, if you sh- if you shot a deer at deer camp back in the day, and you couldn't find it after 500, 600 yards, that thing you'd, we would never find it. Um, you know, even like 300 yards, like every deer that I've shot out at deer camp has died within sight of me. Um, so, but realizing now that a lot of those deer do die, and that you don't want to start tracking right away, like probably could have got more deer and what we did with this doe is we got right on it after after i shot 
you follow the blood trail through the snow. The snow is every, it's a super easy blood trail to follow, and we just pushed on it. And uh, I think if we would have just let it uh, let her go to that first bed where we we ended up pushing her out of, she would have died right there. But um, just a foreign concept that you might want to wait and let let the deer sit for four or six hours or overnight even sometimes. Um, we never did that at, at deer camp. So we pushed this deer all over the place, all over the place. Finally, she circled all the way around, probably after, I don't know, we probably pushed her two miles altogether. Um, saw her one, at one point, but didn't get a shot off. And she eventually went down a steep ridge and into a deep pond that's right down the road from our camp and she was in the pond uh and we had walkie talkies again so we radioed everybody hey the deer's in the pond she's standing and you can't shoot a deer um standing in water in, in vermont probably a lot of places you can't um but you can't do that so she was in the pond and what would happen i, I came came down to the pond and i'm standing there and she jumps into the middle like she jumps out in and starts swimming so she's swimming to the other side of the pond where the road is. So we go to the other side. And then she sees us over there, and she turns around and starts swimming the other way. So we ended up getting hunters to surround the pond from deer camp. And uh, she would go one end to the other to the other. And then she got so exhausted that eventually she got into a shallow part and stood there. And I still remember because I... She kind of went to me, so it wasn't too far away from me where she got to where she was standing. I, I got up there, and I was it, you know, I stood there. Um, it's only 10 yards away from her or so, and she was looking at me in the eye, and you could tell she gave up. She's like, I'm done. I'm done with this. So exhausted. You know, do it. Kill me. And she st- once went, went, waited there for, it seemed like a long time, and then she stepped up out of the water, and I shot her she actually fell back into the water we had to get it you know drag her out um before she floated into the middle um so we got her out and that 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 was just a crazy that that's a story that we talk about all the time you had an injured doe just swimming laps around this uh this pond and until exhaustion um she very easily could have drowned out there but got up to the edge and we took care of her. Uh, that was a, my third deer up there. I think um, after that, it's just it's uh, they kind of all blend together. But I haven't shot a deer there. I think since 2017, 2018. I don't know. It's been five or six years since I've been really um, doing more hunting down in Massachusetts. I really only get up here for basically one good day of hunting. Usually we hunt Saturday. Sunday I want to get back and get with the family again, have some family time. So I tend to leave early in the morning on Sunday, get back to Massachusetts. So, you know, hunt hunt one day in Vermont a year or so. Um, so it's been tough, but this year I I don't know. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm calling it. I'm getting a buck. I'm getting a buck tomorrow in the rain, uh, doing some still hunting. Um, so that, that'd be cool. Cause we have a list out at deer camp too, where everybody who kills every deer kill goes up on a list. It gets reprinted every year. So we got a history of, you know, all the kills and, um, you see, you can, you tally them up and you see, Oh, this guy's killed this many deer. This guy's killed this many deer and so on, so on, so on and so forth. Um, I kind of want to get my name back up on, <laughs> on that list. It's been a few years. Um, because I don't want future generations to look up there and go, oh, man, Pat must have sucked at hunting. He's only on here once every six years. Well, if I can start getting back up to camp, I'm going to try to change that. But with the young kids at home and juggling the amount of time that I spend in the woods down there, and then, uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to beg for forgiveness for, um, you know, multiple weekends going back to vermont as well so you kind of pick your battles and um i think i think for the you know next few years while the kids are young i'm going to be going up one weekend um maybe two maybe two 
And uh, then when the kids grow up a little bit, maybe it'll be uh, every weekend a rifle again because there's just something special about deer camp. The, the bucks there are not nearly as big as the bucks that I'm hunting in Massachusetts. Um, and sometimes, you know, I say there's less deer, but there's actually a pretty good population of deer around around our camp. It's just that uh, the buck to doe ratio is low. There's a lot more doe. You see a lot of doe at camp as opposed to uh, to bucks. But you actually do, you see a pretty, pretty good amount of deer, depending on where you're hunting in Massachusetts. This year, so let's go back to Massachusetts a little bit. It's been a, it's been a pretty slow year for me in terms of seeing, seeing a lot of deer. You know, the last couple of years, I've been seeing lots of deer, 100, 100 plus deer in the woods. 20, I think two years ago, I saw 26 bucks. Um, this year, it's been a lot slower, but I've been hunting different places because my go-to spots in Massachusetts, now they've... Uh, those spots just don't have acorns this year and you know i scouted those spots over the last three four years and and there's been good activity because there's been acorns in there um but this year there isn't in any of those spots so i'm going to new spots um they're more bigger woods you know than the the suburban smaller lots so i've been hunting a lot of bigger tracks of woods and uh it's harder to get in a pile of deer in those bigger tracks but um that first week I saw quite a few deer and the first few the first three four or five sits I was seeing deer I saw that buck twice that I ended up shooting I saw quite a few doe you know I was seeing four to eight deer a sit then that second week I didn't see much I didn't hunt too much that second week the third week when the other zones opened up I started going into my other uh, new spots and I spent a lot I think I've done eight or nine sits ten sits maybe in uh in that one new spot where i passed that six pointer and that six pointer and i saw two doe as well and uh up there but i've only seen two those two doe and that six pointer in all those sits up there um but i do enjoy those sits for some reason i like those woods and it does feel like big buck can pop out at any point i got a camera there that's getting different mature bucks in daylight you know every three four days going on the trail there um, and I got that piebald buck uh, in daylight there. So there are a bunch of bucks that go through. There, there's a good buck population in there. I actually don't get too many pictures of doe on that camera. Um, so it's one of those places I know there's bucks, and you just got to put in your time into that spot. But it does make for some uh, boring sits, you know, not seeing a, a ton of deer there. And then um, I'm just trying to – I got a really big eight-pointer that I had on camera – uh over the summer and i had him a lot on camera and i just kind of fell in love with that buck and uh i i thought i was like cool this is gonna be great i'm gonna he's here like he i had lots of daylight uh photos and videos of that buck all summer long until september 1st or so um and then i i haven't seen he hasn't been on that camera since so this is a classic he was there in the summer and then after that, uh, there's no acorns there, so that's probably what he's doing. It's going to the acorns um, or going deep into this swamp. There's a big swamp there, and he was kind of on the side where my camera was. He was there all summer. There's, um, you know, a lot more kind of undergrowth shrubs and stuff like that to eat uh, on that side, so it makes sense. That's why he's there in the summer, and then come fall and winter, he's going somewhere else, so I kind of um, I wanted to scout the opposite side of that swamp, which is really hard access, long walk to get in there. Um, so I, I went in and scouted that on Halloween. I wasn't hunting Halloween evening, so I just took a camera, a couple cameras in there, although I only laid one down, and did a big loop on that backside to see what I found for sign. And there's some good sign in there, a couple of scrapes, uh, some fresh rubs, but I, I, I did see a lot of um, other hunter activity too. I walked by a couple of cameras. Um, I saw a couple of tree stands, um, but I, I did find a few spots. I found a, uh, I put a camera up on a scrape, marked it on Onyx, marked another potential spot where I could sit. I just had to find a better. I didn't want to do that real long walk back in there um, 
So I kind of marked it, and with the intentions of going back in and check that camera sometime, but finding a better way to get in there, that would be quicker. So I ended up finding that a couple of days ago and went in. Um, there was a southeast wind, which is what this kind of this swamp would call for. Oh, that day that I went back in there and scouted too, I jumped a big eight-pointer, and I think it was him. It might not have been him. I, I couldn't really tell, but I he let me get. It was a windy day. He let me get pretty close to him, I think, 30 30 yards or so he was on the other side of a uh, stream that goes through this swamp he was just on the other side of it and some real snarly thick nasty stuff Um, just exactly picturesque big buck bedding you know right on the other side of a stream you know so that's a barrier for him he feels safe and protected tucked up against that and on the other side of the stream is where it's just all swamp on the side I was walking you're coming off a hardwood ridge and there's some pines in there too but you're coming off you know some higher ground um down into that stream bed so i was walking along that to see if i could find any rub scrape line you know see what i wanted to see is see if where i could find where they're crossing that stream and as i'm just poking along through there um this buck jumps up and he goes into the swamp and i was able to get the binoculars up and and watch him for a good ways because you know swamp this swamp on this kind of open here and there there's there's areas of thick spots but there's openings and uh he was a nice big buck long time length it might have been him it was hard to tell with him walking away but i did jump him and i was like huh i wonder if that that's him and he you know to exactly what i thought he's he's betting over on this other side where the hardwoods are and uh there might be acorns it's hard it was hard for me to find acorns because all the freshly fallen leaves but there's lots of oaks and uh, I'm sure there's some acorns there. I found another scrape not too far from where I jumped him and I found a potential stand location and I was like, man, this is pretty sweet. Double, there was two scrapes there and it was about 75 yards from where I jumped him there, maybe 80, 100. Uh, But I marked that down and I think I'm gonna go hunt that at some point, but I kept walking after that and there was a stand, uh, I don't know, 300 yards away from there which kind of deters me but again someone's not always going to be in their stand um and it's public land so if you can get 300 yards away from somebody in public land um you know i I think i think you're good to go so i might go in there and hunt it uh, probably during the week which most people aren't hunting their stands during the week but i can so uh monday tuesday wednesday next week's looking really good really cold if we get the right wind i might go in there and hunt uh, so anyway, I went in there uh, two nights ago to a different spot where I laid the camera on a scrape early on in that jaunt through there um, just to check it. It's been sitting there for, I think, 10 days or so. And I checked it in the very first videos on it, only a few hours after I went in there and after I jumped that eight-pointer into the swamp, there was that my big eight-pointer coming through to that scrape. Um, it was at night. You know, I don't know if it was that same buck, but it, it could have been. Maybe he jumped into the swamp a little bit and he stayed there. And then after I left, you know, maybe he got curious and wanted to come over and check my scent. Um, and maybe he backtracked it all the way to that scrape spot. Or it just could have been a different deer too. But um, that was pretty exciting because now I know that he is all the way over there. It's about a mile and a half from where he was in the summer. But it's all the contiguous piece. It's just a big swamp, and on the other side, there's a big ridge. So, of course, he's over there. Um, but he wasn't there regularly. He was there only that, that you know, a few hours after I left. But it confirmed that he's over there. So I like that, and I'm going to put a little effort over in on that side. And then even further down, uh, that same contiguous piece of woods, you go through a bunch of unhuntable stuff, a um, couple hundred acres of that, and then on the other side, is where I killed the eight, my eight pointer early season. There's a nice nine pointer over there too. Um, and yesterday, two days ago, two days ago, yeah, three, two or three days ago, I don't know. A couple days ago, I got a uh, that spot had been pretty quiet since I hunted it that first week. I, I have a camera on a double scrape there, and I hadn't been getting any pictures. Um, but there's acorns. There was tons of acorns in there. Um, that first week i'm sure there's still a ton in there so i was expect it was weird because i was expecting it to be pretty a pretty hot camera all the way through but it's been real quiet but a couple of days ago i get a picture of a buck going through the double scrape it's just a little buck 
and then an hour later I get another picture there and it's a giant it's a different eight pointer and it's a freaking giant he's probably 140 to 145 inches or so super super thick got lots of mass on him he's got really long time length huge g2s and threes um and just a beast of a buck and i love that i love when a new buck that you have no idea about just pops up because when that starts happening that's when you know the rut is really starting because these are ranging bucks you know that big buck never seen them i had cameras in a bunch of different places on the other side of the swamp um you know two miles away or whatever uh had one you know just on the other side of this little unhuntable piece where i was just talking about where that scrape and the eight pointer came through there you know you got i got a camera there the last couple weeks he's not on there so he's ranging from somewhere because he's he's been real tight to his core area is what that's telling me because he didn't hit any of those other cameras he's been real tight to his core um but something triggered him to get up and start ranging and that's the that's when the real start to the rut is happening for me so i'd saw him and uh that he went through at three o'clock that day perfect daylight just an hour after that small buck went through there he he scraped uh he freshened the scrape up and he made a rub on the tree that the licking branch is on i like when they do that too so i was there the very next morning hunted there uh that was yesterday and it was super windy didn't see him in the morning got the camera there that's going to keep eyes on it oh and then last night so I hunted there yesterday morning, called it a day, midday, went home to get ready for the Vermont trip and stuff. And uh, a couple hours after dark, the big nine pointer went through there too. He's not nearly as big or mature as this uh, this giant eight, but um, he was there as well. Um, and he sniffed that rub, you know, cause that big buck left his, his scent on the rub. That's what they're doing. They're rubbing their forehead gland there. And uh, yeah, that buck came in, smelled it, was checking on it. And he was actually, you can see where the wind was going. He picked up the, the scent of that buck's gland from the wind, and he came right into it, checked it. Um, so that was cool. So that, that area now is starting to pick back up. The first week in October, it was hot. There were fresh acorns everywhere. Um, I was able to kill that buck. So we saw lots of deer in there. Um, then it kind of went quiet for a little while, but now it's back up. So I'm going to focus on that when I get back um, and do some Massachusetts hunting. I'm going to focus on... Um, hunting the back side of this swamp where I just got that big eight hitting that scrape. I'm going to kind of bounce around in there, maybe try to get down closer to that stream at one point um, where I jumped that buck out of its bed, um, get in there for a couple, a hunt or two, and um, then back to my big six pointer area. If I, if that camera he starts heating up, um, that one's been a little quiet lately. If that one starts heating up with some, uh, mature box and as soon as i see some sign i'm just kind of waiting for sign of chasing i want to see you know they're still kind of just seeking but i haven't seen any chasing behavior yet i know it's happening in some places um just the places where i'm at i haven't had any of that exciting rut action that we love to see bucks just dog and does that uh i haven't seen that so as soon as i see that in any of my cameras i'm going to get into that uh into that spot wherever that may be what I need to do is get back into the back side of that swamp and put a cell cam out because I don't have one over there yet. I just have a, uh, a regular cam, but I'm looking at one in my car, cell cam buck. I mean, a cell cam. Just got to get batteries in it, and uh, next time I go in there, I'll lay one of them in there um, so I can keep eyes there too. But, yeah, just waiting to, to see that, you know, super chasing happening. And got that one tag. I want to fill it on a on a nice big buck. And if that that new giant eight pointers got me excited. But the cool thing about hunting that spot, and and or the other side, the uh, the back side of the swamp, is either of those big eights can be in either of those places. It's one contiguous piece of wood. So if there's a hot doe, either one of them could come come by. So if I see that's just like I should focus a little bit more. Uh, effort on that side because both of these eights are 140 inches plus um i believe so uh, we'll see i hope i get a shot at one of them um but again if i if i see anywhere i got that al that uh that not albino the uh, piebald buck the big six there's a big 10 there and there's another huge eight there too that's in the 140 class um 
if any of them start popping up on that cam where they're chasing over there, like those, those are the bucks I want to kill. The Austin buck, I haven't seen him in a while. Um, since I think, I don't know, it was sometime late October was the last time he showed up, but I do have a cell cam in his summer location. He goes in there when the rut starts. So if he pops up there, I've got a nice spot I can get into, uh, get up on the saddle, only two sticks up, but it's, that it's all I need in that spot. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. Just pulled on to my deer camp road here in Vermont. This is uh, usually where I crack. I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna crack a beer. I'm gonna pull over and go get a beer. Roll the windows down. Uh, I'll be right back. You know, when you're on them dirt roads and back roads, it's all right to crack a beer. Drive slow. You're driving slow anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's the plan for Massachusetts. Um, depend, just depending on how everything is going with uh, pregnant wife and all that and the family stuff. Um other other stuff uh some things to to point out is i'm supposed to be filming lanny benoit this year killing a deer with his uh, woodman arms muzzleloader tracking at the ripe age of i don't know 77 or 78 whatever he is he came up to me at huntstock and said hey i want you to film it i gotta go out and get at least one more buck tracking and i want you to film it so that's i gotta be on standby for that i'm sure he's gonna kill many more than one buck tracking still but this could be one of the last ones, you know, you never know. So um, that's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. When snow starts flying, I gotta be ready to to go at a moment's notice. And um, so that's on the docket for later on this year. Um, and then we're working on some stuff that I want to announce for Huntstock, but uh, it might be a little bit too early because things aren't set in stone, but it, it is looking like next year. Um, of course, we're going to be going back to Wildwood Farm. That was an amazing venue, uh, and I think we're going to do the same weekend. I think it's August 10th, 11th, and 12th next year maybe. Um, you guys have to check. Whatever that Friday, Saturday, Sunday is in that time frame, I think that's when we're going to have hunt stock again next year, so same weekend. Um, and we're going to do a lot of exciting new stuff. Uh, I'm not going to announce everything, but some of the things that we're playing around with uh, is – for content creators, podcasts, YouTubers, um, we want, as as I'm closing sponsorship uh, deals and partnerships for Huntstock, I'm going to be asking every sponsor and partner if they want to add on top of what they're committing to Huntstock, uh, um, you know, for whatever they're committing in cash for a sponsorship to Huntstock, if they want to throw in some extra that will put together a content creator fund for the podcasters and the youtubers that come to hunt stock and i want to keep it to you know the smaller guys so like it's not a fund for sorry you know for hunt suburbia it's not going to be a fund for big woods box or just hunt club you know the kind of the bigger the bigger brands that have sponsorship experience already have sponsors things like that um, I think they're doing fine, but I, what I want to do is help out the smaller podcasters and maybe the guys who don't quite know what they're doing on the sponsorship and partnership side. And it's going to be a way to both get uh, get those content creators some uh, some sponsors, some money coming in, uh, but also some experience in how to sell yourself as a uh, as a platform as a as a property. So I'm going to ask. Um, if you guys are listening, anybody who's a YouTuber or a podcaster that's going to be coming to Huntstock next year, reach out to me. Let me know um, 
uh, that you're coming, and I want you guys to put together kind of just a one pager, uh, who you are, what your brand is, what your mission, um, and how many viewers or listeners do you get on average, and how much do you want to charge, you know, for an ad read on each podcast or on YouTube or whatever. Just put together a little rate card, a little media card. And I'm going to share that with all of the sponsors before Huntstock. But I'm going to start getting them to lock in some extra money so we have this fund for uh, any podcast or YouTuber that's coming. So um, put together your own rate cards. I'm going to share that with all of them. And then the plan is the night before Huntstock, after we've set up all of our booths and we're doing that VIP party, um, that each each fun, each person who contributed to that fund, they have a say in, and they'll they'll have reviewed all of your rate cards and all of that stuff and been able to go through all the materials of all the different content creators and they're going to choose who they want to sponsor. And at that Thursday night VIP party, they'll come up to you, buy you a beer, and tell you, "Hey, we want to we want to sponsor you, and here's how much we committed." You know, and and it should be a great way to make some connections, do something cool and unique. Um, you got a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that we're working on that's really exciting. Um, we should be doing a hunt stock mini at the Springfield Sportsman Show. So um, that's not set in stone because I'm still working on that a little bit, but I want to create an archery, a short archery games contest there for youth and young adults, the 16 to 24 age range, I think is where it's going to land out. Um, and I'll tell you more about that um, on future podcasts, uh, but you know, a short course shooting, uh, shooting about five arrows and doing a body weight, you know, sled drag that mimics a deer drag, um, of whatever your body weight is, uh, to get your heart rate going kind of mid shoot. And then you, you finish with two arrows with an elevated heart rate and you got to do it all in under 90 seconds, working on putting that together, what that's going to look like. We're going to get a bunch of door prizes secured, Um, but you're going to have to be, uh, 16 to 24 to compete in it. And, um, and everybody who does gets, will get door prize entries for these door prizes. So the door prizes are going to be for youth and young adults only. Um, so that's going to provide us, we're going to, we're going to give back to the youth and be able to focus on youth and young adults a little bit more, which is very important, uh, in the hunting world, attracting new younger hunters, which is part of what Huntstock's mission is. So, Um, that's the idea. I think we're also going to extend door prizes if to 12, so 12, 13, 14, and 15 can also get door prizes. They just won't be able to shoot this, this course at the Springfield show. Um, they'll come over to the Huntstock booth and we'll sign them up and and get, uh, anybody who is a youth 12 to 15, will get you door prizes, um, tickets as well and draw door prizes every night at that show. Like we do at Huntstock, it'll be, you know, not $30,000 worth, but it's going to be a good amount. Um, and I'm working on uh, securing, you know, everything we got to do to get to make that happen. And so, on that note, I'm at camp. I'm gonna go into camp here in a second. But if you are a YouTuber, podcaster, I'm gonna reach out to you guys too. But um, if I don't get to it and you hear this before then, um, and you want to come to Huntstock Mini, we are getting a a space there. Um, I think it's like 30 by. 20 30 by 25 that'll be next to this archery competition if it all works out um and we want to get uh there's going to be limited amount of space but some of you podcasters or youtube pages that came and you want to be a part of this kind of hunt stock mini um where we're promoting hunt stocks mission you know going into the big hunt stock in august and we're promoting that if you want to come down and do live shows, we're going to get a stage there too, do live podcasts and seminars like we did at Huntstock. So it's going to be an attraction at the Springfield show. Hit me up because there's going to be limited spaces, but we want people there who are going to be um, just excited to do that, excited to do podcasts, meet people, and kind of have a little Huntstock mini you know, winter festival there within the Springfield show. So um, that's a cool collaboration uh, that I've been working on with Doug, who owns that show. He's a great guy. We want to continue to support that show and, um, you know, hopefully bring some excitement uh, to that show as well in the same way that we did at Huntstock uh, in the summer last year. So, anyway, that's where we're at right now. I'm going to end this. I'm going to get into deer camp and enjoy that for the weekend. And uh, hopefully 
I'll give you a little recap, actually, maybe. Maybe this won't be the end because on the way back on Sunday as I'm driving back to Massachusetts, I might uh, turn this back on and give an update how the weekend went and maybe have a, uh, a buck story to share. So that's it for now. I'm at camp. We'll uh, talk to you guys later. All right, take two. I just recorded a whole update and the microphone was turned all the way down. So I got to do this again. But um, I am not driving back from Vermont from deer camp and doing it in the car like I did on part one. I was hoping to do that. Um, but we are now a week out from the Vermont opener. So it's, this is, um, Saturday, November 19th. And I just want to recap, um, Vermont deer camp, uh, was able to go in and get a buck still hunting on, on opening day, which is awesome. That was my goal going in. It was really great weather for it. I took my time, um, uh, working my way down, uh, the tops of some, some big ridges, um, saw tons of buck sign on them, fresh scrapes, uh, everywhere. I think I probably came across 15, 20 fresh scrapes on the couple of ridges that I worked down. So I worked down one and got down into a valley up through a saddle on another big ridge. Um, uh, keep that saddle in mind, uh, for the future. And then I went down the other side of the saddle and all I'm doing is taking five or six steps, five or six steps at a time, stopping five or six steps, stopping, making my way through, going very slowly, keeping my eyes up. And, uh, when I get to a spot, um, you know, where you can see a little bit, you see a little bit further and you got a nice funnel that you can overlook. I would stop for 10 minutes and sit um, 10 or 15 minutes. And then I get up and keep going and just doing that five or six steps. And every, every time I'd go a hundred or 150, 200 steps and be in a kind of a new location with a new Vista overlooking a new funnel, I'd stop for 10 minutes. And, uh, by the time it was eight 45, I had gone over a couple of ridges and it was finally to some clear cuts that I was targeting to go still hunt through. And I get to the edge of the first clear cut there was tons of droppings everywhere. You could just see around this clear cut, there was deer sign. Um, so I'm just kind of checking that out. And then I pick my head up and I see a rack coming out of that first clear cut. Um, these are, you know, little small clear cuts, not the big giant ones you see in Maine that are, you know, long and narrow. This is just a circular, small clear cut. Um, but this, this buck was making his way out. I knew it was legal right away. He started making a rub um, I didn't have a great shot at him, uh, cause it was very thick in there when he was making that rub, he ended up, you know, I was watching him for three or four minutes. He stopped, turned around, started walking back up the clear cut the way he came a little bit, you know, not fast, just step, a step every three seconds, you know, just very slowly working through. And then he started making another rub and I had an opening and I shot him a little bit quarter and away, went right through his heart. He was probably 40 yards away, 50 yards away. And he folded right there and yeah, it was awesome. That was my first, uh, first buck at camp, first deer at camp in the last four or five years. So I was super excited about it. I was able to get my, um, I would say kind of my first buck officially still hunting with a rifle, um, where I went out and set out with a goal to do that. Uh, and, uh, so that was cool set a little goal and was successful. He ended up weighing 152 pounds, um, which is a, a, on the heavier side for the deer around, uh, around our camp. Um, I was, I was super excited about it, happy about it. Scotland and Jim Lane came to help me drag him cause he was in there pretty deep and up and over a couple of ridges. So, um, having their help was awesome. They brought the jet sled in, got him out, checked him in. Um, and that was that, um, the next morning I had to get up early Sunday to go back to Massachusetts. So I'm driving back to Massachusetts and I get a FaceTime from Scotland who's out hunting and Scotland went back to that saddle. I told them where I seen all those scrapes and, uh, you know, it wasn't too far from where I ended up shooting my, my buck. Um, and there was a saddle I'd always looked at on on X and always wanted to hunt. And I just told him, why don't you work your way in there to that saddle on Sunday and, and sit there where you got a good view. Um, there's sign everywhere. So that's what he did. And he FaceTimed me around, I don't know, it was like 9 o'clock, 9.20 um, on my way back. And he had just shot a big, he goes, he goes, Pat, I just killed a big buck. I just, I just dropped one, I think he said. Um, so I was like, is it laying there? Like, no way. But is it laying there? He's like, yeah, it's dead. It's dead. He had dropped him. 
And I was just, I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. Evan was extremely excited, obviously. Um, and when he got up to it, you know, on the video, I was like, oh my God, Evan, that is a huge for a round camp. That was a huge buck, man. It was, the rack was poking. I mean, it was a nice mature rack, um, three points on each side. And if he had brows, it would have been just a big, beautiful eight, but he's a big, beautiful six pointer. Um, had some good mass to him too. And he was very wide and good time length. And I was just, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, gorgeous buck that, um, uh, also it was, it was ended up, uh, when he checked it in, the biologist estimated, um, it'd be five and a half years old, uh, took a tooth. So we'll figure that out. Um, and he weighed 170 pounds. So as far as deer camp goes, that is, I think the number four buck of all time at camp from the 1950s to now the heavy, the fourth heaviest buck of all time. And, um, I don't know, probably a top 10 impressive rack as well. So it's just a, an amazing deer for Scotland being three years in now he's been at camp for three years. He's got two bucks, two six pointers. He's on a roll. Um, just couldn't be happier for Evan. Um, so uh, again, dude, congrats if you're listening to this one and, uh, I know you're going to kill a lot more deer. I'm happy that I got you into hunting and that we can share some memories going forward, dude. Uh, Just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful deer. Congrats again. And then um, today is Saturday, November 19th. I went out hunting this morning. uh, First morning hunt I could in Massachusetts in a long time. Uh, Brutally cold, (laughs) mid-20s. Hands were freezing. Uh, But it was quiet for the first time this week. It wasn't blowing 30 mile per hour winds. We've had relentless winds this week, which has just made it's made sitting really difficult. Um, And uh, so I went in this morning. I was set up 20 minutes before legal shooting in the saddle. Um, Two nights ago, I was in the same spot. I saw a four. I was sitting on the ground because it was too windy. I got out of my climber and just kind of ground scouted and still hunted my way over. I wanted to check the other side of this piece and got over. Sat sat on the ground. I was on like a rock pile. I was elevated a little bit, um, and I ended up seeing a four pointer and then three does. So um, that four pointer went up past the does and and wasn't interested in them. So I knew they weren't hot yet. Uh, but that's why I went back in there this morning, two days ago, they weren't hot, but I haven't been seeing very many does. I haven't had does on cameras. It's been really hard to locate a doe group. So, uh, you know, if they weren't hot on November 17th, I mean, there's a chance any day they're going into heat. So the 18th yesterday, um, I did not hunt there. Um, and then this morning went up, uh, was in there 20 minutes for illegal because of those does and that they can get hot anytime. Well, I saw a doe at 7 a.m. Uh, she was kind of trotting down the ridge I was looking at. She was acting a little bit funny. I felt like there's probably going to be something behind her, but I didn't see anything behind her for a couple minutes. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I did. I heard something. And they're about 100 yards away, but I see another deer pick up the binoculars. He's a nice buck. He's a, a mature eight-pointer, but um, not one of the three bucks in there that I really want. Um so just watching him and he's kind of just, uh, pestering her a little bit, not full on chasing, you know, um, it wasn't a chase fest. He's just kind of following her, uh, nose to the ground, a uh, little bit of pestering. Um, so I watched him and he's going up the hill and I try to get the video camera on him and I didn't know if, uh, the video camera was catching anything or not. So I'm moving, moving the camera, get him into frame. And as I'm doing that, and what I think is that buck in frame walking up the hill, I see another deer enter the frame. Um, and I was like, oh, there's another buck, I think. So I um, stopped playing with the camera, picked up the binoculars, and it was another buck. And uh, I'm not, wasn't able to really identify it. I haven't looked at the footage yet to see if I can go back and see. He didn't look like he was one of the three that I want to shoot, uh, maybe a different buck. But I was just excited to see some rut activity because I haven't seen any yet. And again, just, um, I was, I was pleased with going back in there, hoping one of those does were going to get into heat or multiples. And, uh, you know, who knows if that's one of the three doe that were in there, but that game plan worked. At least I was kind of in the game there. They were a hundred yards away. Um, if they were, uh, a buck that I wanted to shoot, I would have probably grunted and tried to get them to come back down. Um, and see if that would have worked, get him into range. 
Um, but I just kind of let them, let them walk out and meander their way out. So, um, that's this morning. I sent a text to the group chat from deer camp, uh, with Aaron, Jim and Scotland, uh, my cousin Aaron and, uh, and just let him, Oh, I just saw, saw a doe, a couple bucks following this morning, put the phone down 10 minutes later, I pick up the phone and the phone's blowing up. And my cousin, Aaron, my cousin, Aaron shot a giant buck at camp. Like for some reason, Camp is, you know, I don't know, maybe it's rebounding out there and it's uh, becoming, um, you know, a better place to hunt because for a while it's, uh, it's well, it's it's still hard. It's a really hard place to hunt and there aren't big bucks. Maybe we're just getting lucky, but Aaron shot a, a giant racked buck for around there. It might be, probably, it might be number two, number three. I don't know if it'll beat Steve's 11 pointer that he got at camp, Um I I don't remember what that one looked like, but score wise, um, this might be a number two or a number three buck of all time at camp as well. It's a nine pointer. It has mass like crazy, uh, lots of mass like you don't see around there, um, and it's got a lot of time length too. The crazy thing is, uh, it's not very wide. It's it it was uh, inside the ears a little bit, and you know he's he's a young. It's a young deer with a great rack, just some phenomenal genetics. So um, I'm hoping that those genetics, Scotland's deer, first one he got three years ago too, the taxidermist said that, you know, it had phenomenal genetics. It was a year and a half old buck, and it um, had great time. It was a six-pointer at a year and a half with awesome time length and really big um, uh, brow tines for a yearling. Um, so maybe there's some good genetics. We'll keep monitoring that, but Aaron, awesome, awesome deer, man. And for, so camp has been hot this year. I've got my first deer in five years there. This little dink now, of course, (laughs) now after Scotland and Aaron shot their deer, my deer is just a little dink, but, um, I got my first, first buck in five years. Scotland got, uh, a top four weighted buck of all time. Um, and just an impressive, beautiful, mature buck, um, the second day. So he's got two six pointers and three years out at camp now doing awesome. And then Aaron, um, I don't remember when, uh, I think Aaron's killed a deer at camp before I have, so it might be his first in a couple of years, um, but not quite five. Um, and just with a phenomenal, phenomenal nine pointer. Um, so then that could be a top two or three racked buck at camp too so we got a lot of tops plus we got our first bear at camp this year plus my uncle andy got a four-pointer and he got a doe so we've already got five deer and a bear out at camp this year two really impressive deer um it's just this is a banner year at camp and we're only into the second weekend so um I'm kind of feeling rejuvenated about camp, you know, it's, uh, for the last couple of years, been focusing hard down here in Massachusetts, but I'm, I'm feeling great about, um, the prospects of camp and bringing Scotland into the fold there now, introducing him to hunting. He seems to be loving it and he's taken right into it and he loves the whole camp atmosphere and everything. So, um, you know, I think he's going to be a lifetime member out there at camp too. So, um, kind of regenerate the tradition out at camp now. You know, it's, uh, and there's some new lifeblood and guys are getting deer and it's, it's, it's awesome to see. So, um, that's where we're at. Uh, I'm going to try to keep giving you guys updates on the season every week here. It's tough to get guests during the season and, uh, a lot of family stuff going on here. Um, uh, it's just tough, tough to line up guests to come, uh, to, to come at night and during the season. So, um, when I can get guests on, we'll get them, but, uh, other than that, you guys will have to just hear my voice, unfortunately, uh, given recaps. Um, look, what we're looking to the for, uh, to the future here. What's what's in store? Um, I think I only got next Monday and Tuesday, um, maybe Wednesday morning, to hunt the rut, and then we're ho- heading to Vermont for family time, some Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving uh, reunion we do up at my aunt's house whole family will be there already tagged out in Vermont. So I won't be hunting. Um, but so if I want to get a deer during the rut, I think Monday, Tuesday are going to be my best bet. I'm going to probably focus in on where this hot doe was, um, um, today and that doe group, because, um, those other two might be getting into 
heat here pretty soon and i know there's just there's some great bucks in that piece they can come through anytime so i'll probably focus there on monday tuesday and uh i think that'll be kind of the last hurrah for rut hunting in massachusetts because when i get back you know the monday after thanksgiving um of course you know uh, there's still going to be some rut activity um but i think it's going to be well into the lockdown phase deer aren't going to be moving as much and then um and then we got gun season, uh, and I'm excited about if I if I don't have um, my second buck down by gun season, I'll bring out the the Woodman Arms. Um, I haven't really got to use that in Massachusetts very much. I haven't hunted gun season because I've been getting my my bucks with the uh, with the bow before gun starts. Um, but I I I'm excited to if I can't get one with my bow to take out the Woodman. Um, both these spots I've been scouting and hunting this year that are new spots to me, um, where I've got quite a few mature bucks. It's just hard to get them into range. Um, the woodman will be nice. I mean, both the spots I've been hunting, I can see 80 to a hundred yards. You know, this spot I hunted today, you can see beyond a hundred yards. Um, so, uh, they're actually great spots to bring a gun. So, uh, I hopefully if I can't get one with the bow, Um, and when gun season starts, then I'll be able to get one with the Woodman. So, um, that's it. We'll, uh, see you guys next week or the week after again, trying to do them weekly. Um, sometimes they'll be bi-weekly and, uh, just thanks for, thanks for sticking in with everything. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I know you guys, uh, uh, really enjoy it. I, I, I love it. I'm getting lots of DMS. I'm getting text messages from new hunters who, uh, I think I've got six new hunters this year who have killed their first buck and, um, in some shape or form or saying that the podcast helped them get the buck. So that's all super rewarding. I feel like I'm there helping, you know, kind of guiding a little bit, um, unofficially just from the podcast. So keep, uh, keep sending those in. Um, I'll keep, keep up with the updates and, uh, good luck with everything, everybody. And we'll check in with you guys soon. Big bucks I've been dreaming often Every night till I'm in a coffin From my woods to the burbs of Boston I'm looking for a tree to get lost in Chris Warner's little dust in the snow Quality time, just me and my bow Fall evenings, I know just where to go For some quality times for me and my bow It's just me and my